right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri. And I'm one of our joint professors at the Department of Engineering Science and uh, one of the organizers of this lecture series. Uh, let me thank uh, Mr. Sharam Arivani and also uh, uh, Kate Lab, who in fact uh, helped me in organizing this, uh, this series. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Department, the Science Department, and the School of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank you all for attending this uh, uh, ninth lecture uh, for this academic year. In fact, it is, thank you not, 144th lecture since the time uh, we started this uh, lecture series. In fact, uh, Dr. Uh, Rahimi was one of those guys, in fact, who, uh, you know, uh, who in fact uh, agreed to my request to start this lecture series in 2006. Uh, All right. Uh, two uh, uh, announcements uh, for today. Uh, first, uh, we are going to have delicious pizza uh, coming at uh, 5.30. And then uh, please uh, you know, uh, help yourself as much as you can. And uh, let me mind, uh, remind you that we are going to have a class at 6 o'clock. So we need to wrap up and then uh, get out for, for the uh, for the next uh, class. Uh, next lecture uh, will be on the uh, 14th of uh, March, uh, titled Grid Voltage Regulation with Distributed Energy Resources by Mr. Mark uh, Maldasari, Director of Code and Standards, Enphase uh, Energy, Petaluma, California. Our guest speaker for today is Mr. Rod uh, Tsuyama, uh, and the title of his talk is uh, Radio Wave Propagation in Open and uh, uh, Abstracted uh, Environments. Mr. Rod Tsuyama is the Chief Operating Officer at Upland Solar in Santa Rosa, California. He has over 25 years of engineering management with 14 years of research and development program leadership. He has cross-functional expertise and experience in leading, uh, purchasing, manufacturing, and design engineering teams to achieve best-in-class results. Rod utilized his skills and experience at Tektronix, Keithley Instrument, and Hewlett Packard, Agilent, and Keysight in all aspects of, and, and phases a program in mechanical, software, uh, test, and electronic hardware development uh, through production ramp. He has managed remote sites and organizations of five, five to 60 people. Rod has an associate of science in electronic technology from Santa Rosa Junior College and a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Cal State University in uh, Sacramento. So here is Rod. Hello, I wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, actually, I like radio frequency stuff. Just I don't know why. I'm just kind of that way. Uh, one thing I was curious about for you all was how much. I mean. Are you guys all Radiohead geeks, or are you, <laughs> or are you uh, just interested in trying to learn a little bit more about about the field and the applications and stuff? So I see a mixture of yeses and head nodding and stuff. Okay, so um, as I said one of the things. Oh, one of the other things I wanted to go through today was currently Operant Solar, which we just changed our name to Operant Networks. You may notice if you if you have, depending on how good your eyes are. Um, one of the things that we've done is change our name to become a little more generic because that's one of the things that we're finding out with the technologies that we've been developing, not only um, for the original problem we thought we were going to solve, but for some of the some of the follow-on things that we're looking at doing. So, oops, let's see, what will work here? Ew, I'm kind of stuck, let's see. Ah, here we go. 
I don't know, it wouldn't recognize the keyboard or something. <laughs> See, I'm not good at some of the computer stuff. <laughs> so this is uh, operant's history in brief. So in 2015, there were several of us that were sort of kicking around going, hey, I wonder what we want to do next. So we were kicking around some ideas and we decided to pursue the area residential solar uh, communications parts. So I don't know how many of you guys know what that means. Or how many does that look like? What does that look like? So in a nutshell, every solar panel, uh, not every solar panel necessarily, but every solar installation really wants to be able to communicate back to the mothership someplace. And the mothership could be um, uh, in the model of these third party operators. Third party operators are guys like um, um, Sun Run Singevity, um, <laughs> uh, Vivint Solar, those kind of guys. These are guys who will install and then they base, and then they basically you're leasing your roof to them for a while, and you get you get, get the uh, the net metering benefit as as the homeowner. Well, one of the issues with them is they want to know, be able to predict a little better when it's time for them to go out and do something because panels wear out or uh, squirrels come up and eat some of the wires and things like that, and um, they need to they need to know that for two reasons. One is if they've got the maintenance contract, they want to make sure that they're coming out and doing it proactively. The other reason is really so that they can um, the way that the financing works for a lot of those third party operators is that they don't they don't necessarily have the capital to install to have, to buy and install the solar up front, but they get part of the net metering benefit. That actually goes to a third party financer, and those guys are basically trying to figure out, am I really getting my money's worth? So that's in a nutshell sort of the basis for that. We also discovered that um, kind of in that industry for those guys, about one in five systems isn't like actually connected to the internet for a variety of reasons. And, and the fundamental reason is they're using the, a lot of them are using homeowners internet and a lot, and they all have single communication links. So that's where we started thinking about Operate Solar. And what we ended up doing was, um, that was our first step. It was like, oh, we got a great idea. Second step was, eh, how are we going to fund this thing? Because there was some hardware there, certainly software development. Um, and what we did was we discovered that, lo and behold, the U.S. government, through the Department of Energy, has got a grant program called SunShot. What SunShot does, it, is, it, it very much is, um, it, its um, charter was to foster innovation and technologies that would help adopt solar and renewables, and specifically, we were in the solar project. Um, and so we applied for it, we gave our pitch to them, and they said, sure, <laughs> in a nutshell. So we launched off on that, and that was really the first part through, through uh, 2016 was, was developing both the hardware and the software uh, for the product that I'll show you in a second. Then <clears throat> we, we, just, we discovered, oh, there's like other, taking it to the next step of just being able to, from doing just a demonstration to doing something where we could pilot in multiple sites. So we got that award. That was the one that, that we're actually uh, been working on since 20, late 2017. Um, that one's interesting because that one's more, okay, now that's fine. You guys did all your prototype stuff and that looked encouraging. Now I get it out in front of real customers more and more. And so we were learning a ton of stuff about that, not the least of which is some of the trials and tribulations of trying to schedule with some of the people who agreed to run pilots, some of the companies that have agreed to run pilots with us. Um, also in 2017, um, we added our chief commercialization officer and he was, um, Really important again for this getting back to a customer, getting finding finding the right customers and 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 um, engaging with them properly, because I'm kind of a nerd, <laughs> and uh, my partner in crime is also kind of a nerd, and we're like a little introverted, despite what it may look like today, because um, I know you guys are friendly. <laughs> anyway, so that's so then um, as we were going through this sort of churn and time frame. We were realizing that, that the software that we're using to do our networking, which is really basically taking advantage of having two radios on site and then being able to mesh them together to ensure that we can com keep communicating between sites. What we realized was that the software stack, the networking software stack we were running in, inside a basically a TCP IP network, you know, it has a lot of untapped potential. Now that's something we've been doing in partnership with UCLA, as it turns out. The, they're the big guys in this NDN thing called Name Data Networking. And the fund, there's a lot of differences between that and TCP IP kind of networking, but the fundamental thing is instead of trying to get to a site, 
We're trying to get the data. And so you name the data. And then in 2018, we got awarded a DOE, another DOE grant to expand that um, to develop improved transaction security for low power edge computing. And basically, we started thinking about, well, how do we, how do we, you know, now that we've got all these things, it's kind of like an IoT thing, right? Now we've got all these things spread out all over the place. How do we keep them from being hacked and then messing up people's uh, production and stuff? Uh, and we've been working, continuing to work through commercialization. Here in 2019, so far, we got awarded an, an SBIR, which is a small business innovation research contract through the government <clears throat> through the, and uh, with the U.S. Air Force. They were interested enough in what we were, we were doing that we've got like a short contract with them right now to basically work with them and explore their areas of interest. And hopefully that turns into another bigger, somewhat bigger contract. Um, and we've got some more uh, applications in process right now in terms of grants and whatnot. Any questions about that? The biggest, the biggest lesson from this is, well, we started one place, and now we're sort of going out into other different places and trying to, trying to find what our real, real niche is, and it's typical startup. Yes? So how many people is it? So we're a three-person company right now with several people who are contracting with us to do work. We've also got a, um, a five-member board of directors who are basically acting as our business advisors and saying, hey, you know, you can't do that, or, well, that's really stupid, or, or no, that sounds like a great idea. So that was part of the business structure thing that we decided to take on per, fairly early, was to make sure we had independent people looking at what we're doing. Because, of course, we can get all excited and say, oh, this is great. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Have you thought about it? And so that, that's been very valuable and a great experience to, uh, to go through. Other questions yes. on that part? Yes? Uh, I know the answer, but uh, I think it's good for the students. Uh, did you need to put any of your own money to it? <laughs> yes, that's what we ended up doing. So, the, so um, the, our co-founders ended up putting money in there, partially because the, um, this first award was had some cost sharing involved in it. So basically, the government was saying, okay, we'll give you, um, for every dollar you put in, we'll give you four. So that way we have skin in the game too. It's not just a grant, so it's a little different than a straight up award. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so we put some money in. Um, also, there were some people, and this was the thing that sort of surprised me, was I just talked to people about what we were doing, and there was a couple of them said, well, can I give you some money? <laughs> and I was like, well, okay. <laughs> now, one of the things about a technology development is it's really kind of risky at that point, but there's also potentially really big returns, like Facebook <laughs> or some of these other things. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I don't know how many times I was telling these particular people, like, look, you know, I, you know, this is like really risky, and they were like, no, 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 we kind of believe in you guys. Um, that was, so that actually puts even more pressure on us to try to make sure that we're, we're actually delivering on what we're trying to do here, which is make a company. Yes? There, there, there are sometimes opportunities for startup companies and small businesses to, to actually cooperate with a university and then apply for a grant. Is that Possibility. That's been one of the things we've been we've been doing um, along the way here. You said UCLA, but I was thinking more locally here too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we had picked we had picked on UCLA originally because of the the name data name data networking um, stack and technology because it was a lot. One, we knew that it would fit into a small processor, the the part that they needed. And that, that seemed like a really good thing, because the processors we've got in our, our hardware are pretty small. Um, and even though there's plenty, there's memory and stuff in there, it's just really making it responsive is, is kind of a thing. So, and I realize there's all kinds of other IP network stuff that's trying to lighten things up. Um, but getting back to that fundamental thing about saving the, naming the data and looking for where the data is as opposed to looking for a particular machine seemed pretty powerful to us. We weren't exactly sure then why it might be powerful. But then as we started going through the next few years, we started to realize, oh yeah, there's some stuff in here that's um, applications for this, um, which I can talk about a little bit uh, later, that are pretty exciting in a lot of ways. So one of the, one of the applications is, um, for instance, if you're in a mobile environment, or where your connectivity is intermittent, like with your cell phone, potentially, like most places around here is pretty good, but we, went, we, we have some things going on in Kobolo, and the connectivity is really bad. So when it goes away, now if you're just looking for that particular um, 
phone's information or trying to get someplace and you've got no way of bridging it, there's no way of knowing what it was, you know, it's disconnected. And then when you want to do the second piece, which is improving the security transactions, so basically every time you're exchanging data, you want to know that that's, it's real data that you're getting. Um, there's various blockchain-y type things, but every time you lose connectivity, the blockchain basically has to reassemble itself uh, in a weird way, and you really can't get that guy back. It's really, it's more difficult to get that guy back in. Um, whereas this, this work has been pretty, pretty exciting in a bunch of ways. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, kind of, okay. <clears throat> yes. Um, uh, which programming uh, language did you use and why? So the answer is kind of yes. <laughs> so for instance, you know, you can imagine, so down in the device, we're basically uh, programming uh, an app melt processor. Maybe I should draw this a little bit. So down in the actual device, or the, let's call it the sensor, so we have an Atmel processor working down there. But we also have, for redundancy and, another, and other reasons, there's this thing called Electric Imp, which they were a startup to and they partnered up with us fairly early on. Um, their, their processor is running something called Squirrel. This one down here is you know, running embedded Atmel, you know, program in C and whatever, uh, Sharp. Then, once you actually either through Wi-Fi or, um, uh, well, let's just say going up to the Wi-Fi, then it gets up to this thing called an agent. Now, this is device code down here, agent code up here. So then now the agent is, and the thing down here, both of these are squirrel. Now you get it from here. Now you get that information, you get it up here. Now we're doing all kinds of things with it. So, you know, we're using um, a third party um, solar monitoring system from another third party that we've um, a potentially customer partner. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why I kind of say yes, because eventually that then gets presented to a web browser. So it's kind of everything in between. It's, it's kind of broad, including networking stacks and, and that kind of stuff, but that's, that's fundamentally what it is. And NDN is, is kind of pretty C-ish like in terms of some of the constructs, but it's got some significant differences. Uh, other questions on this part? Okay. Um, oh, and here's the people. So, like, lots of smiley, happy faces. So, business Keith Rose, he ended up being our chief commercialization officer. Maybe I should use this. <laughs> Nicely provided. So, this is our visionary, Randy. I'm just kind of the guy that gets stuff done. The chairman of our board is Dave Bass. Uh, so, you can kind of tell from history, Dave, Randy, Dave, and I all worked at Hewlett Packard. Um, and and Agilent, and oh, I'm missing my Agilent thing. Uh, but in addition, Keith and, and Randy worked at Solmetric, and which was acquired by Vivint Solar four, three years ago, four years ago. They're just over here in Sebastopol. Um, our key partners, so this is that Sunshot program I was talking about from the Department of Energy. And I gotta tell you, I, I, this program is great, because there's a lot of people who say, get money from the government, it's the best money you wish you never got. Um, these guys are really, uh, they were a little bit cowboys in a lot of ways, and they've done a tremendous job at keeping a lot of stuff off of us in terms of, uh, they do provide oversight. We have monthly meetings with them, and there's certain requirements that we have to meet in terms of financial reporting and things like that. But the team there have done a marvelous job of making it really straightforward. It's like, fill this out, <laughs> and then tell me every, every time you want to invoice. So they've done a wonderful job there. UCLA has been our partner. Uh, in developing the NDN software, and so they're, um, it, it's an open source based thing. It's also, the, the other, NDN was an offshoot, or depending on who you talk to, it basically, it's a it's a, another version of something called ICN, which is information-centric networking. I don't know, how many of you guys have heard of either of those? Fundamentally, the big difference, or the big similarity is they both name the data, and there's a lot of different approaches that were taken in terms of security and whatnot. This one, um, Alchemist Accelerator. This is something that, as a startup, was kind of an eye-opener, because I'd heard of these accelerator programs, and we actually tried a couple to varying degrees of success. <clears throat> these guys were really good. So for what turns out to be a very pretty modest um, um, part of our company, should things get really good and we, and we sell for bazillions of dollars, 
Um, they're providing a lot of resources. So some of the resources they provide are basically defer being, the ability to use some of their vendors to defer payments when you're cash strapped like we are. Or, and the, the thing we've been using the most, which has been the ability to network with, with people who are kind of in our space and would be able to provide yet some more perspective on does this make sense or not. So we've like iterated business plans and done things with these people. It's just been phenomenal. Um, also, the, the idea kicking around and, and things has just been huge uh, for this particular accelerator. A couple of the other ones there were, didn't have quite the network base. Um, for instance, a couple of guys, I mean, we, we ended up just little old three person us right now, ended up talking to a guy who was, um, I don't know, do you guys know Digi International? This is one of the C-level guys at Digi International. I mean, he just retired, and he said, and we were kicking ideas around. He says, no, this is like, would be really great if you could do this. Turns out we couldn't. But that was the kind of insights we were able to gain from these guys and do it pretty quickly. Um, so this, this program I think is another one. So this, this whole part key partners here have been pretty, pretty important to us. Questions on that? Working with partners, working with grants? And, oh. The other part, by the way, the reason why we, the other reason why we really like this part, is it's all non-dilutive funding. So they don't want anything from us other than getting the technology moving forward and our cost share. Ah, finally, we get to the part. <laughs> so here's what we're doing. So again, remember the basic problem was the single lane, single path communications really are fundamentally you know, not as reliable as multiple paths. Um, so what we've done is we've got this, I uh, coined this phrase, multi-axis communication. Um, oh, back to this. So I know this one's hard to see. So we, so basically we've got multiple radios down in this hardware. Um, the antenna's integrated in and everything else. This is an example, and uh, I should probably blow that up someday, of Basically, we've got at each one of these vertices here, we've got a site in a neighborhood. It's about 900 meters from there to there. And what we're doing is we're both using either customer Wi-Fi or a cell modem connection as the primary source, let's say for this one. But if that one goes off, then it's got multiple paths that it could take to get data back up to the, to the internet or the, or the mothership. Yeah, that's kind of the fundamental thing. The other thing, some of the other meshy, networky kind of things, they won't really want base stations, towers, that sort of thing. So it's more mimicking the cell phone thing. And we looked at it a couple times, and we don't want to put that infrastructure in. Just it's expensive at permitting, and it takes a long time, and all those things. All the same, all the reasons why it's expensive for cell phone companies to have rolled out. So hardware software optimization. Um, Oh, and so some of the interesting work that we've done in terms of the network part of this, besides making sure the radios work and the range and everything, because um, the antennas and everything else are built into here. And then you hang this on the wall someplace. That is, anybody that knows anything about radio frequency propagation say, well, that's a horrible way to do it. But then that's what the customer wanted to be able to do, the installers and whatnot. They don't want to have to get it all the way up on the roof, even though they're up there already. Um, they don't want to hang an antenna because the homeowners hate that because they think it, most of them think it looks ugly. So we had a lot of constraints on the initial thing here that I think we've done a pretty good job of doing at uh, dealing with. Um, let me talk about this one a little. So, so that's kind of the hardware and the, the fundamental software, that part of the fundamental software, just the networking part. Then there's this thing here. Um, this, as I was talking, saying some of, the, some of the things, some of the big challenges in IoT is there's lots of things you can do to secure your data. There's lots of things you can do to secure that every transaction like a bit, Bitcoin thing is doing. Um, and they all take processing power and power power, like, you know, DCAC power. Well, you don't have that <coughs> in sensors. Very usually you've got, because of the cost constraints, you usually have pretty cheap processors in there and it's really hard to get everything to fit. Um, so that's, what we, that's the part we've been working. So what we've got basically, and it says blockchain, but it's sort of not. Um, what we've achieved is something pretty lightweight where we've demonstrated uh, as part of our um, 
uh, one of our grants here, uh, was to demonstrate that we can actually have multiple devices and we can say, for whatever reason, that one is suspect now and we're going to take it off the net, or that one basically got away from us. It, it lost communication and then now it, we never violated it, it just went away for a while. Now it's coming back, now we can reestablish trust with it really quickly and get back on, on track with things. Lots of interest for, with people that are trying to do, you can imagine, do blockchain -y kind of things with it. Um, questions about, I mean, how many people actually know what it takes to do the Bitcoin blockchain kind of data mining stuff? A couple yeah. people. Yeah, so in fact, one of the founder's sons, <laughs> well, the founder, the visionary's son, He's actually got a little Bitcoin thing going on in his in his home, <laughs> and his parents got really, really mad because suddenly their cooling bill and their electric bill went way up because he basically took over one of his rooms and got like this huge, basically set of servers running in there mining bitcoins. <laughs> so they gave him a very good lesson in in fundamentals of business, which was they said, now we're going to start charging you for the excess energy that you're using in our home. And pretty soon, if you make enough money, we're going to start charging you for the space. Um, and he was only, his, the dad was only half kidding about that. <laughs> Actually, he wasn't half kidding. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that, that's one of the, again, one of the downsides. So you can imagine now you're trying to put this in all these IoT sensors and things like your Apple Watch or whatever. It just, it's just not going to work. Uh, yes. About cloud, uh, do you have any place, uh, I mean, any cloud that you use to? Uh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Actually, we've got two, and so this is where some of our other ideas and, and approaches have come from. So this, we are currently using. So Electric Imp. This is one of the reasons why we thought these would be a good partner for us. Besides, they were about the right size, um, and they had interesting technology. In fact, their interesting technology was that. They were one of the first guys to actually put hardware uh, keys inside their, basically their Wi-Fi chip. So that you, and what they do is up there in the, um, the imp cloud. So what they do up there in the imp cloud is they won't, then the agent, they won't talk to this thing unless they know what it is. And, you, and in order to know what that is, there's a commissioning process you have to go through. The other thing, because this the, the founder of that company was like a security nut. He actually, oh, he actually was an interesting thing. He actually was one of the, the project managers and one of the really early, uh, or program manager on one of the really early iPhones. So one of, part of his reasons when we when we were meeting with him, part of his reason for um, leaving and starting a startup was he just didn't believe that people were taking IoT security seriously enough. And this was about eight years ago when he did that. So he's got his company, it's running. They got like Pitney Bowes and other people that are big, big uh, um, uh, customers of theirs. So basically in here, they've got basically in very big kind of layman terms, they've basically got a sheet that we're running our network stack through um, around us. Now, getting back to answer your question about do we use multiple clouds? Well, basically now what we can do is there's this monitoring company, and this is one of our uh, potential customers. So the monitoring company has their cloud. And now what we're doing is getting to some user over here, getting the data. Eventually, we get the data presented up to some user through a web browser. And what we're doing is we're basically feeding data this way through this other cloud. Um, and this becomes the interesting part. So now we started talking to people about, well, what are your security concerns about this area when you're going cloud to cloud between companies? And that's opened up like this endless thing of, thing of yeah, that's kind of like a problem. Now, it does get dealt with, don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a VPN, you know, a lot of guys will VPN over or do whatever, they'll make a secure tunnel and that's all well established. The thing we started talking to people about, well, and this is part of the military. <coughs> so what about if it's number two, or number, or cloud number three, or cloud number four, or cloud number five, or you know, on and on and on. Now, what do you have to do? Make all these connections to all these different clouds? That's kind of a thing um, that can get pretty difficult, time-consuming, and hard to manage long term. 
Did that answer your question? Sorry, that was kind of a long way to get around cloud, or your question actually, cloud to cloud and that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, that's some of the work we're looking at um, in terms of this investigation um, for the Air Force. This is an open call. This is not a military secret. This is an open call for technologies for uh, the U.S. Air Force to evaluate. <clears throat> It's a big deal because <laughs> uh, most, again, most situations people think about is, well, okay, I'm going between two companies, but uh, there are multiple, you know, as, as more and more peop things become cloud-based, there's more and more and more of these things that are going to start popping up every day, whereas multiple clouds. Um, let's see. So, yeah. Oh, <clears throat> and so these are two of the customers that we've been looking at and engaging with that uh, who may want to. Hopefully, we can purchase someday. Oh, and then this is another thing about finding things along the way. So we were cruising along, and we were thinking, yeah, residential solar, that's kind of our thing. And then there was a microgrid network up here, actually it's in Sonoma, uh, that kind of approaches us and said, you know, hey, they've got a problem on their microgrids, which their particular microgrid happens to be very distributed. Um, do how many of you guys know what microgrid is or what it looks like in any, nobody? Oh, okay, good. So a microgrid is basically a large um, commercial scale solar thing. So you can imagine instead of having your um, three kilowatt system on, on your roof, this may be 300 kilowatts. It might be a few megawatts. It might be anything up to 75 megawatts, which is then considered truly utility scale solar. So what they can look like is um, they can look like Huge arrays, you know, a bunch of solar arrays sitting down in some lot someplace. Um, so, so like uh, at uh, Keysight Technologies in the parking lots, um, depending on the size, those are general, could be considered microgrids. Um, and Kaiser and a lot of other places are doing that. In addition, the it can this particular one, happen, the Stone Edge, happens to have things that are on their site kind of spread out and they've got multiple assets. So they're, they're kind of, lead, this one is leading the way and being sort of a test lab in a lot of ways. So they've got, for instance, they've got you know, solar array, solar array, biofuel gen fuel generator, uh, battery storage, and so they've got a fairly complicated array of renewables and uh, distributed energy resources sitting on, on their site. The other thing that occurs then of course is you've got all those things going on and then you've got your tie to PG&E or whoever they're going to be in the future, which is, so this is a grid tied, called a grid tied system. One of the things that they won't need to do between all these multiple types of assets in addition to multiple assets distributed around is they need to manage it. So who's putting what power into the batteries? How are they putting power back out to PG&E? How do they deal with disconnecting and things like that? Um, talking to the guys in the, in the project that are out there, um, one of the big problems they have is they wired it because they didn't know about us when they first put it in. Two problems, right? So one problem is they're all hardwired in through this fairly big, like 16 acre campus. And so one thing that has occurred has been somebody took a plow through it. <laughs> and it happens. The other thing that happened, the other thing that they actually told us happens more often is people start messing around in here and they start disconnecting things in the wrong way in terms of just like the land communication and stuff, the ethernet ports. And then they, then they gotta spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the heck happened. So the reason why they like our thing is, well, okay, we put one of these things here. One, they don't have to deal with people, you know, taking port A to port B. And two, they have much less uh, opportunity for the, for the backhoe or whatever to come through it. Um, they also like the, our interface to their hardware because the comment from the guy when we first hooked it up there was, that's it, you're done? Yeah, that's it, it works. <laughs> and, which they really liked. So that's kind of our product in a nutshell. And uh, oh, actually, anything else you guys want to know about what we're doing? I could talk about this stuff for hours and I realize we've got a bunch of other stuff to get through. Yeah, Can you say a little bit about your hardware? Oh yeah, so the hardware here is, um, I'm trying to turn myself into more of a network software. Dot and I have known each other for, I don't know, too many, <laughs> a whole bunch of years. So the hardware has basically got, oh, I can start drawing it here. So I already started with, we've got two processors in there. We've got a, uh, we've got a digital radio down here, essentially. I'm doing it the same way there. Um, actually, it's inverted, but 
we'll get there. Then there's a Wi-Fi radio or a cell radio. And then, so basically we've got the two, you know, antennas sitting out here. Power in, we've got a, we've got a serial, serial bus input for data coming in. Mm -hmm. And pretty straightforward, that's it. Actually, this is, this, this is kind of a funny view because a lot of this stuff here is actually conditioning the power supply of all things. Because we want to make sure not only keep bad stuff from coming up, like when people connect and disconnect things to the power here, but also to make sure we don't get bad stuff coming out. Really important that we don't like pollute up somebody's uh, lines. Like the FCC sort of cares about that a lot. In addition, the FC, what the FCC cares about is that we're managing our spectrum, and that we're not putting out things in the wrong places, and we're managing how much power we're putting out. So uh, it turns out this, um, this ends up being the, elect the, le the electric imp chip, and the good thing about that is, is they, they give a reference design, and, and we've emulated it, and so that takes care of a lot of FCC stuff in terms of product development. Um, the rate, this is the bigger antenna, this is a 900 megahertz antenna, and this turns out to be the, uh, the Wi-Fi antenna. This one here uh, is more of, a, more of a challenge for us, because one, we wanted to maximize the amount of power we can put out, and that 900 megahertz ISM, does it, anybody know what ISM means? Or who doesn't know what ISM means? Okay, so... Industrial that, Scientific Medical? Yes. Industrial Scientific Medical, yep. So basically it's, a, it's an unlicensed band, and we just got to make sure that we don't put out anything in the licensed bands. Um, there's also the inter, you know, between radios um, uh, interference and things like that, which we actually figured out. <laughs> the most elegant way we could figure it out was, well, when one's broadcasting, we turn the other ones off. <laughs> it just seems to work. And it acts, but it's actually just like um, the FCC rulings on, um, like having all the radios in your in your uh, laptop. You know, because you get a Wi-Fi and a Bluetooth, and depending on what thing you've got, you might have a cell radio in there too and stuff. Um, pretty important. Uh, let's see, where does it go? Yeah, so it's basically a pretty fundamental, uh, pretty simple, straightforward block diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, the devil in the details was getting the antenna right, because that's a PC board antenna. And the uh, other devil in the details was uh, making sure that our communication between these two processors was appropriate. Um, it's pretty straightforward now, but there was a few things we had to figure out <laughs> um, and make some decisions on. The one thing that we um, actually implemented at Electric Imps, um, uh, one of their inputs was basically I can, I can reset this processor from here and I can reset that processor from there. And the thing we needed to be careful of is we didn't get in a loop where we were both, both things are trying to, trying to reset each other all the time, which actually happened when we were first messing around. Um, the radio itself down here is, uh, uses a modulation format called LoRa. I don't know anybody. I really wasn't planning on talking about modulation formats today, but it's essentially it's it's a it's a digital radio, um, which means it's 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 basically changing phase um, on the on the carrier, and that's how it's conveying the information across. Now, its real claim to fame is it's like 150 160 dB dynamic range between the receiver and this is a transceiver between the receiver and the uh, uh, which. Is like a big deal because you, you can only you're limited in how much power you can put out. How many people know how much a typical cell phone power tower puts out power wise? Anybody? Like 20 watts. It's not a lot actually because like your FM radio stations they're like in kilowatts or more. Um, the FCC's limits limits the this ISM band to one watt if a bunch of caveats about how your modulation is working, which basically is all intended to make it so that multiple people could be in using that band and not interfere with each other. Um, some of the older modulation formats, basically the loudest or the biggest signal won. And so then for a while there was a, the ruling was, you know, if you get into that band, then you have to, for, before you get into it for data, you have to first listen and make sure nobody else is using it and then you can do your thing and then you have to stop and listen again before you can get back on it. And that's kind of cumbersome and it makes trying to plan network timing really hard because <laughs> you don't know when you're exactly going to be able to get stuff out there. FCC is another group that 
lately, frankly, I don't know how closely you guys have been following their rulings. I have to do this because of our nerd thing here. But uh, there actually seems like they're moving towards the right direction in terms of making things more friendly. Now, they're not doing it lightning fast, but they're relative to some of the changes that have been going on. It's actually working out pretty well for radio spectrum. I'm not going to talk about the, uh, some of the other things that they've been doing. <laughs> So now, getting back to this, what are we looking for in a new graduate? Well, you know, this is kind of the, this is kind of the, the basics. And, and what I'm saying, we, I mean, sort of in general, this is what I found doing this and, and looking, looking for people over quite a few years as being a manager. These are sort of basic um, and required. Basically, you know, essentially most of the time you don't get in unless you can demonstrate some level of competence there. Some companies do this by Basically, they just bring in a whole bunch of people, and when you don't work out, they get rid of you. And frankly, that's the way some places are. I don't like to do that because I think it's a waste of everybody's time. Uh, one of the things that, obviously, hardware guys, you all need software skills to be pretty good. And by that, I don't necessarily mean you need to know all the networking ins and outs and stuff, but you certainly need to be able to do things like run, run simulators and figure, and figure out how to make them work on your systems and things. Also. All these things here are tending to have a lot of, um, not tending, but they have a lot of, of interface control things that you need to deal with. So like, for instance, this radio, we talk to the radio, you know, we don't set the radio by adjusting um, resistors or doing that kind of stuff. We end up programming it to say, well, I want you to do this. And so we get into embedded programming. Embedded programming is, is pretty big here, uh, which is basically, for most parts, is I got to know what registers I need to flip when and how. Right? Um, digital, obviously, has been that way for a long time. RF, like I said, and analog is getting more and more that way. Even power, you know, power supplies. There's a lot of today. There's a lot of battery uh, power supply management chips. Like Linear's got quite a few, and TI and those guys. Um, well, whoever bought analog devices, but you know, so those are all things that you need to be able to to use as part of your tool set pretty um, pretty easily. And with the more complicated designs, our design is pretty straightforward and simple. Um, you know, these days a lot of designs are getting really complicated, and so being able to diagnose and use all the all those things is getting really important. Software, and this was my sort of yeah standard tool set. That was my answer to you. <laughs> it's like kind of everything, and some of these things are hard to predict in the beginning because you you don't necessarily know. So. Um, Oh, and then the other thing that's really important is domain knowledge. Knowing what the customer wants versus needs. Basically being able to say things like, hey, here's a microgrid. I understand what their problems are and what they're, they're trying to do. So now I can understand how my solution, whatever it is, will fit in, in, their, in their space. These are the ones that I found are really just as important. And, and both if you want to be an entrepreneur or if you want to work in a big company and, and uh, do that kind of stuff. Communication, especially of complicated technical issues, um, it's really important because I've spent a lot of time with some people, some engineers I've worked with. I know you know what it is, but you're not letting me know, letting, telling me what it is exactly. Um, sometimes it's about problems. Sometimes it's about great ideas. And I, there's been, there have been great ideas that get lost because people just couldn't get them out there in the right way. Teamwork, hard work, passion. This is why, you, you know, for my kids, I've always told them, you know, it's, it, it's really important that whatever it is you want to do, that you really that you get as your job, you really want to do it, for whatever set of reasons drives you that way. Um, this one is deserves actually probably bigger bullets. Learn and apply what you learned really quickly. Um, some guys I've been working with and around and and stuff, it takes them a long time, and then they take a long time to actually be able to, to uh, use what they've learned. That's really important. So a lot of the stuff you guys are getting here in school, in terms of picking up new concepts or, or moving forward, yeah, that's, that's what it's going to look like. Some of, the, some of the times, a lot of times though, when you're working, you won't necessarily get the luxury of, here's your class um, to get through, and then you, you get exams, and then you go through, and then you start applying it. it and you may not get little chunks. But your ability to take a fairly big topic and then start breaking it into chunk, chunks yourself, really important because that way you can start to apply and learn and figure out what you don't know and move forward with that. It, um, the businessy kind of stuff, task es estimation, 
and then do be able to quickly say, eh, that's not going to work, and understand why, re go back to being able to communicate why and what, and what the concerns are and work with the team. These are the things I've, I've found really can make for superior engineers, uh, the ones that tend to be um, uh, uh, promoted, getting great assignments and that kind of thing. So is this a surprise to anybody, either of these things? It's not a surprise. Nobody believes me. <laughs> nothing? Yeah, I got nothing. All right. So now onto the part that was actually the title that I <laughs> we got you in here on. Um, so today, radio waves get used a lot in a lot of different places. So most of you guys kind of said, yeah, you've got some passing familiarity with this stuff. So if I say megahertz, kilohertz, gigahertz, who doesn't know what I'm talking about? I'm oh, good. Excellent. How many, of you, how many of you have not seen a slide that looks like this, where there's applications and um, versus the very various frequency ranges? Everybody seen something like this? How many of you have not seen um, basically the wavelength to the wavelength to frequency conversion kind of thing? All right. Cool. That means everybody knows going to know more. So. In the lower frequencies, traditionally, this is Don and I were talking about some of this stuff before. Um, maritime radio navigation, lots of communication. This slide in particular was a lot of communication, a little bit of radio astronomy. So um, AM radios, aviation radios, nav systems, that kind of thing, traditionally been in this sort of 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz range. So like AM radio, 500 kilohertz to uh, 2 megahertz kind of a thing. Uh, short wave television stuff in this, you know, tens of megahertz kind of range here. Uh, also, I put, oh, it didn't come out quite right. Um, so both, between 300 megahertz and 3 gigahertz, things get really crowded because there are things like MRI, some of them, most MRIs are down here around 60, but then the things start getting crowded where like GPS systems are down there, microwave ovens are there, television, phones, GPS, Wi-Fi, you know, on and on and on. So this range is really crowded right now. Um, the start of this range here, this three, you know, five gigahertz range, and there's a new Wi-Fi uh, band out at seven gig now, uh, is getting more and more crowded too. And this is one for communication systems is kind of a problem because what you'd ideally want to have is a big chunk of bandwidth that you could just use and you could maximize how much uh, information you can pipe through any given, given carrier. Uh, what's had to happen here for Wi-Fi, of course, is you get your 2.4 gigahertz bands, you have multiple channels inside the bands. Some of them are contiguous, and, and so those are definitely not contiguous in there. Contiguous in there. Even within some of the bands, you, don't, you, you may or may not, you may have interferers in there, or different reasons you may have to jump around and, and not, not be using the whole um, uh, band of frequencies available in the Wi-Fi. It's kind of a problem. Satellite communications, on the other hand, or point-to-point -point microwaves, have generally had a better, bigger, more bandwidth to deal with, um, and so that they can. They, that's why you can get more uh, information down and around. The problem with going up in higher frequencies is traditionally has been much harder and more expensive to generate the frequencies that you need to be at. That's one sort of businessy proposition. The other businessy proposition is that um, you have loss going through the air. Oh, this was just another example of how these are, to, basically it's the FCC frequency allocation chart. So you can see how things are, the, because these are log scales, it doesn't quite show what I wanted to do, but there's lots of different areas sliced out here for, for license bands, for radio, for every, basically a lot of the things are described in here. Um, I've got the links down there if you guys actually want to go pull up the big chart. Um, and since I didn't know how savvy you guys would be, realize that, realizing that a lot of this frequency versus wavelength versus ITU designation, the abbreviation here, the IEEE bands, and there's a couple others I didn't list on there, those are all things that um, people commonly refer to these things. I tend to just stay with frequency because I'm simpler that way. So higher frequencies, more available bandwidth, that's good. 
However, higher frequency is more expensive, both to manufacture as well as to generate power in that. So in, in recent years, more IC-based designs. So again, this radio 20 years ago, that would have been like a pretty big thing to have accomplished. It would have been potentially individual transistors or if you basically an amplifier module, an LO module, a digital generation module, an IF uh, uh, thing. And now it's like it's like a really small chip. It's like really nice to deal with. Same thing with Wi-Fi. Years ago that would have been. What I see happening is is that more and more that the, there's there are more and better techniques for mass producing higher and higher frequency radios, silicon on ICs, uh, ICs on silicon, and those kinds of things, higher level modules. Some of the stuff Don and I used to do way back in the day, <laughs> except they were still pretty big and bricky and stuff like that. But that was again, those were steps along the way to uh, making it inexpensive enough and deployable enough because five gigahertz radios a long time ago just weren't a thing. I mean, it was hard. People could do it. Um, the other thing, and this kind of gets back into the total picture of, you know, you really, if you've, if you've noticed with cell phone coverage, some places seem to be get better or worse over time. And what's happening there is generally they, the cell phone guys make a plan based on what they think the coverage is going to be, and they put a bunch of towers out. And as Things ch the demographics can change so that you either get overloaded towers or somebody just put up a big building or, or, or lots of things like that, that their coverage isn't as good as it used to be, so then they got to figure it out again and move and put another tower up. They don't like doing that, obviously, because they're expensive. Um, I think the big towers, the, the larger cell phone towers, I think I saw some that was like $300,000 to, to put in a tower, and then there's permitting and other costs associated with that. There's some pretty big, um, and then another thing is it's like leasing space on the tower, so people will lease space on the towers and stuff like that. Now, for 5G, and this is kind of where I got this idea from, or you know, that, that's this concept here, is you basically just keep putting more repeaters and towers. Now, who knows what 5G means and what it's going to do? Good, you're all honest. <laughs> Because it's like a really huge standard, and it's got a lot of things in it, not the least of which is using different bands of frequency, uh, different, higher frequency bands, like 27 gigahertz band. Um, but 27 gigahertz doesn't propagate very well in the air. You scratch your head, and how are they going to do that? Well, their plans have been that they're going to basically put a whole bunch of little repeaters. So um, the Xfinity Wi-Fi hotspots thing, you guys, who's got an Xfinity or one of those kind of guys? So, so you probably know this, right? So they've got this, they, they got this thing where they keep saying, well, you know, you can just use it anywhere. You can be part of that network and all those other kind of stuff. And basically, when they first rolled it out, um, a lot of what they ended up doing was, you know, the, for your, um, your home network, your Wi-Fi router then part of that, that um, bandwidth and became for people walking around if you accepted that stuff. That's the idea, is they want to, however they can, put out as many repeaters as possible in there for these higher frequency bands so that they can then hand off sort of from place to place to place. Um, the other one is that Verizon's been doing uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in Sacramento, but also they were trying to do it up here too, was basically put small cell towers. So they got these small cells. That's how they're dealing with it. But the fundamental thing is, more towers, more repeaters, more infrastructure to be put out there. Um, oh yeah, and then San Jose had a better proposal on how they were going to extract money out of uh, renting their street lights for people to put little small repeater towers on, or repeaters on. All those things are just trying to get around the fact that there's loss in, in straight free space. So I'm going to start with free space. Um, and so, yeah, blah, 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 there's some math i got to put in there. So uh, for direct line of sight, free space, this is the equation that you use. Uh, loss of dB, distance meters, all that kind of stuff. So for this example, um, the loss is like 113 dB at 3 gigahertz, or, you know, one of the, roughly one of the cell phone bands. I picked the numbers because it made the math come out easier, frankly. <laughs> but um, um, so that's a lot. You guys are all familiar with dB scales? Okay. So this is a problem 
um, because usually your receivers have a floor of how small a signal they can receive reliably. Um, but the other thing, of course, to note is if you change frequency, just go to 870 megahertz, you get about 10 dB um, of improvement there in free space. That's okay, and that's good, which is why people want to use lower frequencies. So why doesn't everybody use lower frequencies? Well, antennas get bigger and that kind of stuff. And it's more crowded down in the lower spectrum. So when you actually get into trying to get into air, this is like a classic curve here, which basically shows the contribution due to having to oxygen and the contribution to having the uh, having water vapor in the air. And I forget this particular one, but there's a there's a certain percentage they assume of, of oxygen and, and water in the air. Um, so in this example here, so let's try a one kilometer distance and uh, the additional to um, the additional is pretty small. So basically you just say you just kind of look at, at these these things down here. Now using 60 gigahertz, all of a sudden that's right about here and you see, oh my gosh, and this is the scale here is dB per kilometer. So this is like huge. I mean, how, how on earth could anybody use that? And there's physics as to why that particular frequency is one of the one of the places. Who on earth would ever want to use that? Who knows who knows what applications there are for 60 gigahertz communications? Car anybody? Radars? Go ahead. Car radars? Okay. Cars are about 70 gigahertz, so they're close. They're around here. Anybody else? Hmm? Military security. That's right. It's a feature for the for them um, because ship to ship communications. You don't want people to know you're even talking to each other. Now, that's historical. These days with satellite imaging and stuff, it gets a lot harder to hide a ship. But still, if you've got if you've got ground troops or things like that, people still use that. The other big application for this is satellite comms. Because now you can be the satellites can be talking to each other, and you don't have to worry about it getting down through the atmosphere. Um, and again, good point. So the car the car radars because you don't want the radars propagating too far and interfering with uh, with other other radars. That would be bad. Uh, the other one that was uh, getting popularized for a while was um, using it in urban settings between buildings as point to point radios. And again, that had the, the feature of in radios. Now I'm going to get to some of this in a minute. One could imagine. Okay, so I got a couple buildings here, and I'm XYZ company, and I want to have I want to open a pipe between these two things, and I'm in an urban environment. Well, what would you do if it didn't if you really didn't have a clean way to to connect these things underground or whatever? Well, you got to start digging up stuff. That problem's gotten, certainly for newer cities, has really gone down quite a bit. But for older cities, there's still this infrastructure thing of, you got to dig this thing up. So the cheap and easy idea was, well, I just put a radio up here, and I'll put another radio up here, and I'll just have them talk to each other. Okay, fine, you can go through all the licensing and everything else you need to do. The problem, however, becomes if they're, if they're going to propagate, if the frequencies are going to propagate really well, this is going to hit here and bounce around there, and there's all these other buildings. So there's a lot of multipath and things like that that start to affect how the radios are going to hear each other. The, so this is, again, why the 60 gigahertz became two reasons. One, lots of contiguous bandwidth there. And two, the fact that it doesn't propagate very far is actually an advantage in that situation. Uh, and then this one, so that was one, that was one thing. I started to touch on some of this stuff where there's basically four big things that affect radio propagation in the wild. One of this is shadowing, where I'm trying to basically broadcast from here, and or this thing here, and I run into places like down in here where because of the roof line, I can't, you know, the signal drops off quite a bit here. Terrain shadowing, which it doesn't quite work like this picture I was able to find. Um, but you get the idea. It's like, okay, there's a hill there. Now I can't, unless I put a tower up high enough, I won't be able to hear it. Straight attenuation going through buildings, which can be very significant, of course. Um, anybody know what a typical wood residential wall loss is? 
I do because I had to figure it out for the other thing. So NIST had done a bunch of data years and years ago. And so just getting through, just getting through the, the sheathing, dry sheathing, some studs and that kind of stuff, it's like 3 dB a wall, which is half your power is gone just getting through the wall. Um, reflections, as I was saying, so basically it hits something, it loses some and comes there. Um, this is a way of trying to deal with that basically this in this case they're trying to take advantage of the fact that it'll bounce off this building and then shatter down there it's kind of hard to count on that though because lots of things change that um, oh by the way i did say dry wood on purpose because of course wet wood changes it gets worse um, and see so this is actually probably a little bit more it says bend but really there's some diffraction and uh, that goes on here essentially is what, what happens. So you can get something here, or maybe something in here. Um, each one of these things is a math problem onto itself, number one. Number two, not all buildings are built the same. Not everybody's urban environments are built the same. This is like a hard, hard problem to solve analytically. And so the approaches that, that people have taken have been to create models. And the most famous ones are this um, Okamura and Hata models. Um, they, you know, and basically they were covering the earlier and the cell phone kind of bands of stuff here. This was the latest one that they did. And this is like really old. They started by basically doing a bunch of drive around testing in, um, in Tokyo, of all places, high density urban environment. Then they, started, then they started taking a few other, um, e even within this urban areas here, they've got some um, differentiations between very uh, dense urban and less dense urban um, suburban. So, you know, they start to break this out a little bit more. So they basically come out a little bit different, but it's basically a bunch of things that says there's a free space loss plus some mean attenuation plus corrections for the antenna heights of the, what you're really going to get. Because, by the way, this back, oops. This back here affects both antennas. All these, all these effects affect both your transmitting and your receiving antenna. So having different antenna heights and stuff like that. Um, so I took, so as an example, I, you know, there, took the uh, the real equations, kind of crunched them. So for a 3.7 kilometer distance, the some assumptions about how hard high the antennas were, we get a path loss of about 126 dB. And remember the free space model was about 103, so if we got about 23 dB more loss in the system, which could actually break your radio. Now, the good news is for cell phones, they can put out 20 watts, which is like a lot. <laughs> um, and so that, that picks it up. So there's this whole thing of dynamic range where you know more power for a given receiver threshold, you can you can manipulate that around. Oh, and then, um, so I started looking for tools and, and whatnot. So with the tool stuff, they're basically, and I went and looked a couple of quick things. I've used this one before. It's kind of lacking in a lot of ways. Uh, and then what I found was I just used Google Earth's ViewShed feature, and that's what this is. So what it does is I've got an antenna situated here with an assumption about how tall the, um, how tall the antenna is over the ground, and then it basically is trying to figure, calculate shadowing. And in this case, since this happens to be up on Fountain Grove, it's pretty much the shadowing is coming from um, terrain obstructions. What I found when we went, so we actually did this, um, I was trying to compare this technique and this technique. So I actually went through and did this, and they both have their sort of faults. This one is, in theory, supposed to take care of different environments, and they don't actually do a very good job of it. Um, but this got us in the ballpark. So basically when I look, so the way to use this kind of tool, you know, now there are ones you pay money for like, uh, that are like this tap mapper thing, uh, that are better, but they still have this problem of what's your specific environment looking like, what's your specific thing. This let me know, yeah, I shouldn't count on things in here in general. There's a few places out here, both looking at the geography and then looking at the, um, uh, looking at the, the proposed coverage. I was able to go, yeah, we should probably drive around there and see what coverage is going to be like. So it helped me actually reduce the amount of drive time things I was trying to do. Um, obviously, cell phone guys have a lot 
more vested interest in figuring out where they're going to put their cell towers. Um, but that's, you know, but, but, and so they've got a couple of the planners that I know, they actually have proprietary software that they're using uh, that takes more of this stuff into account. But they still, again, have the same fundamental problem of what's your exact geography, ge geometries, and terrain going to look like. So kind of the, the takeaways are, yeah, this is kind of a, this is kind of a hard problem. Um, there are a lot of tools now to help help you design and do what you want. Some of them, like I said, are free and get you to the first first order ballpark. Um, the range planning continues to increase because you know as you want to make sure you have enough coverage. And by, when I say range, I don't necessarily mean cell phone towers. I mean like being able to say indoors. I've got my my Bluetooth whatever thing, and I want to be able to talk to my computer, or I want to be able to take my Bluetooth in the other room. Or for like these home uh, nest systems kind of a thing, I want to be able to have have the right um, ability to start sprinkling things around in my house and have them start talking to each other or keep talking to each other. Um, it's really, and I realize I'm over time now already, but it's really hard to get into stuff. I hope I've left enough breadcrumbs in there about some of the places I've looked at and things like that. You can it'd be useful to you. Um, and again, in general. Communication, at least for me, has been one of the more well-known things. Again, there are other applications. So in terms of imaging, both, both medical imaging as well as terrain mapping and those kind of things. Material composition, so basically looking at dielectric constants and how, they, and how the radio waves are either penetrating or refracting off them. Um, processing, most of the time it's heating. Power distribution, this is my uh, ode to Tesla, because <laughs> he was really wanting to broad, uh, you, guys, you guys all know the Tesla thing, right? Um, just a few of the things, so, and they all have something in common, which is really getting the, generating the radio waves is one thing, receiving them is another, but transmitting over them some media is kind of the important piece that, that uh, is not to be forgotten. Questions, comments, that was, I think that was pretty much it for this. Yep. Questions, comments? I put everybody to sleep. Huh? No. Everybody say, where's the pizza? Right? <laughs> All right, so uh, feel free. I'll be around here for a while. Um, feel free to give me a holler and happy to answer any questions or whatnot. All right. Yeah. And thank you. Oh, by the way, thank you for the opportunity to speak. To me. Yeah, I'd like to thank you a lot for the next lecture. And uh, I really learned a lot, so that you can take your time. Thank you.